gives me great pleasure to introduce Ken Corvo, who is very modest and sent me a very short introduction. <laughs> uh, Dr. Corvo's work in the field of family violence began in 1984 as a director of a child abuse prevent prevention agency in Cleveland, his doctoral study at Case Western University focused on identifying how disruptions in early childhood attachment were associated with the perpetration of domestic violence in adulthood. It is this work which brings him here today. And it is this which informs his most current work directed toward integrating findings from research on general violence into domestic violence theory development. So please join me in welcoming Ken Corvo to the stage. Oh, you left the mic at the correct height. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, I had prepared um, 54 slides uh, for this afternoon's presentation, and so I decided to edit it down, and I got it down to 57. <laughs> so um, to, to cover the task of early life risk for domestic violence perpetration, I thought, well, I'm going to tell you folks everything you need to know. <clears throat> Unfortunately, all my colleagues that came before me already did that. So I'm going to give a little bit of an improvisational interpretation of my presentation, if that's OK. Uh, skip over some of the things you've heard um, repeatedly over the last couple of days, and highlight a couple of other things that are unique to, uh, to domestic violence work. Uh, I'd like to ask first, um, who has, is currently working in domestic violence, partner violence, or who has in the past? May I see hands, please? Okay, a good, good sprinkling of folks, good. Because there are some issues um, in, in policy and in practice in domestic violence that are sort of um, baffling if you haven't been exposed to them in the past. So I'm going to go through some of that uh, to highlight what some of those policy and practice issues are and how that, those policy frames uh, has shaped inquiry into domestic violence. Uh, first, I'd like to begin with defining some terms. Um, often you hear domestic violence described as, as battering, and persons that do that are, are batterers. This is a term that you find in uh, government publications, Department of Justice, uh, state offices, and many, uh, many agencies use that term. Battering suggests uh, a certain kind of domestic violence, principally uh, male to female, unidirectional, uh, and it is uh, associated with other range of, of power and control tactics. You see this illustrated uh, diagrammatically in the power and control wheel, which is emblematic of, uh, of how a number of agencies think about domestic violence. Um, there, there's very little evidence that that description of domestic violence um, actually applies to very many perpetrators. This, this pie chart um, is derived from the national uh, survey that was done by Murray Strauss and Richard Gellis um, in the 70s and replicated again in the 80s. And it is the percentages of different sorts of partner violence um, of the total number of persons who responded as having perpetrated domestic violence in the last year. So the, the largest pie slice, this sort of greenish one, is mutual minor violence. And that's 36% uh, of persons who responded to a national survey who had engaged in any domestic violence was mutual minor violence. Um, the next slide over, female minor violence, about 12%. Male minor violence, about 14%. Mutual severe violence, and I'll talk about 
the measurement that was applied to this. It's the conflict tactic scale, and it has specific items uh, describing escalating severity of violence. So 12% were mutual severe involving beatings, use of weapons, and so forth. Uh, female severe, 12%. Uh, many people are surprised to see that um, male severe violence is less than female severe violence at 8%. And we now know, subsequent to the Strauss and Gellis research studies, that same-sex domestic violence occurs in roughly the same rates that heterosexual domestic violence occurs. So these are percents of all persons that have reported domestic violence in a calendar year, excuse me, in a 12-month year, plus an additional specification for same-sex violence. Uh, the term intimate partner violence is, um, is, is used increasingly. Uh, domestic violence is still the preferred term across, uh, across various uh, vectors of the literature. Um, domestic abuse, domestic violence, um, in state statutes, those are sometimes used to describe other forms of intrafamilial violence. The most commonly used measure is the conflict tactic scale. Um, it is a, uh, I believe it's an 18-item scale that begins with pro-social kinds of conflict resolution as item one and ends with the use of weapons in, in item 18. And persons uh, have sort of a variation of a sort of a Likert compressed range scale to respond. That gives you a rough quantification of number of acts of domestic assault taking place in a year. So um, the, the, the primary places where uh, domestic violence perpetration has been studied are in um, perpetrator treatment programs and in sort of um, national or non-clinical samples. Uh, neither one of these two uh, samples support construct validity for uh, the term batterer. Uh, persons who are arrested uh, for domestic assault, uh, some sort of domestic violence, they're not arrested for battering. However, if they um, are convicted placed on probation or some sort of diversion and referred, they referred to batterer treatment groups. And the implications of being referred to a batterer's group, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna sort of deconstruct that a little bit later. Um, depending on the year, depending on the jurisdiction, the rates of, of arrest are roughly four or five to one male to female across, across states. Um, just as sort of an aside, the issue of uh, racial characteristics of perpetrators is very difficult to find in a, at a national evidence level. However, several states um, and a couple of local jurisdictions have looked at the race of perpetrators and have found roughly um, that being black is a six to eight time risk for being arrested or being a victim of domestic violence. And so, being black is actually a greater risk for being arrested for domestic violence than being male. Um, the national surveys, the large national surveys, found um, equal levels of perpetration for males and females uh, on two large-scale applications, 4% uh, severe, 11%, including minor acts like um, pushing. Uh, when this data was first released, um, out of the uh, Family Research Lab at the University of New Hampshire, people were stunned to find that the rates of perpetration, at least as defined by the conflict tactic scale, on a national representative sample were identical. And those numbers were roughly replicated 10 years later at the second administration of the, of the uh, survey. Um, some persons were so upset that um, Marie Strauss, uh, his house was threatened to be bombed, and one of his doctoral students I was told that a terrorist called and said her child had been abducted. That's how upset people were at the time. Um, this is a distribution of conflict tactic scale scores from a perpetrator treatment sample. And as you can see, I hope, uh, to the left is the fewer number, to the right the more, more, and you see the severe skewing. So in effect, the majority of persons, even in treatment for domestic violence, repeated, re reported a relatively few number of acts in the year prior to uh, their intake. 
into programs. The, the, the common way of thinking about domestic violence in the uh, sort of policy practice paradigm that I'm going to talk about in, in more detail shortly um, is that um, it is a strategy for male domination uh, that involves various tactics and is socially supported through institutional arrangements and so forth. Um, another view of it is that a learned behavior that comes via uh, uh, social learning theory and intergenerational transmission. Um, I, I don't think either way of thinking about that is very useful uh, for, for treatment, so um, I've come to see it as a primitive coping strategy and that um, it's a maladaptive and destructive way of managing oneself under conditions of stress. Um, symptomatic of disorders of impulsivity, neuropsychological impairment, as we've heard sort of repeatedly over the last several days, emotional dysfunction activated within the context of intimacy or primary relationships, usually, if not often, exacerbated by substance abuse or dependency. Uh, that view is supported by the, um, the literature on risk that I'll be looking at in a, in a more abbreviated form than I'd, than I'd planned. This is where the, the sort of politics, policy, and ideology of this may seem a little unusual to people that aren't familiar with the, uh, the field. Um, the, the policy apparatus vertically sort of begins with the, the Department of Justice as the policy custodian for domestic violence uh, perpetration work. Uh, they're a conduit for the Violence Against Women Act money and set the stage for uh, overseeing pass-through funds to the states and then subsequently to local, local agencies. And the guidelines they put, put out sort of shape how people think about this, as well as what happens at the state policy level. So I just want to read a couple of the things that are forbidden, uh, forbidden by states who have the oversight responsibility for determining which perpetrator treatment programs will be allowed to go forward and serve persons who have been uh, referred by uh, a judicial de decision. So some of those things are anger, stress, family of origin influence, traumatic brain injury, trauma, mental illness, and addiction. All of these things we know to be associated in some way with violence, and in some cases known directly to be associated with, with partner violence. So, it may seem puzzling that things for which there is empirical support are forbidden by a policy framework from being part of how one goes about working with perpetrators. And I'll give you an example of this uh, to illustrate. The shelter in uh, Syracuse um, runs a perpetrator treatment program. And a couple of years ago, they decided to add two components to their standard treatment model. I'll talk about what the standard treatment model is again shortly. Those two components were anger management, a fairly meat and potatoes approach to anger management, and the second was they were going to now allow persons into the group who were self-referred. That is, they would come and say, I want help with my violent behavior, can I come into a group? Um, when the state of New York found out that the shelter had made those alterations in their approach, they told them to stop or their funding would be cut. And they said, well, we want to serve people who want to be served, and they said, fine, and they eliminated their funding. Now, most of us know that persons who self-refer are the sort of gravy of our clients. I mean, people, they're already motivated, they're already sort of along the way, and uh, might be easier to work with. Under this sort of framework, those people are seen as undesirable because the assumptions embedded in the policy model 
lead one to conclude that only coercion can change violent behavior. And in fact, the policy statements from the Department of Justice say that programs should fully utilize the coercive power of the criminal justice system in the treatment of domestic violence perpetrators, which means that a self-referred person is not subject to that coercion. Therefore, in this kind of through the looking glass world, they're seen as undesirable clients and attempting to serve them result in termination of funding from the State Office of Domestic Violence Prevention in New York. And, and while I'm beating up on them, I'll continue. Um, and if you, want, if you want to verify these sort of policy frameworks, there's a website, its acronym is BISCMI, it's an acronym, BISCMI, and it links to all of the certifying agencies of all states. So you can go there and look at what the state policies are regarding what is permissible in working with domestic violence perpetrators. So this can be verified. Um, the state of New York in their recent iteration um, has, a, has a section that says um, that traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder are not causes of domestic violence, but rather are excuses that perpetrators will use to justify their violent behavior. Right? So maybe this weekend you have some free time, go look at some of these websites and you'll get, I think, a fuller flavor of the sort of distortions that I'm, I'm talking about. Um, how does this play out in terms of governmental funding? Uh, National Institute of Justice made no grants for the purpose of studying risk etiology or developmental factors in perpetration of domestic violence in a 12-year period. I haven't checked since. I don't imagine there was a breakthrough. Um, none of the NIH institutes um, made any R01 grants. That's the primary grant mechanism in the institutes for the study of developmental risk for the perpetration of domestic violence within the past five years. They have, a, they have a searchable database. You might want to also, while you're looking at certifying agencies, look at this weekend. Um, what you find more commonly is that um, the exposure to domestic violence uh, is a risk factor for impacts on children. We've already had some discussion of that over the last uh, couple of days. That, that is fundable, and uh, you see often uh, a focus of study. So how did, how did this come about? Um, brief historical view, um, the, the emergence of, of domestic violence as a policy issue comes out of the intersection of the uh, second wave feminist movement in the 70s and 80s, the victims' rights movement intersecting with uh, a shift to conservative views of law and order, sometimes referred to as the punitive era. So you get this for, sort of strange bedfellows arrangement between uh, feminism and conservative views of crime that create this sort of um, odd but intersecting view of what motivates persons to do crime. And um, th that motivation has to do with holding perpetrators accountable in a blaming way, um, disregarding known empirical ideological factors leading to criminal behavior. And this shared interest in viewing crime that way has created this odd sort of, I wouldn't even call it alliance, I would just call it an intersection. And when you look at um, the, uh, the statutes concerning domestic violence perpetration, you see that it resembles more sort of traditional conservative law and order views than it does notions of, of progressive feminism. Um, so, so there's a policy interest that directs persons away from psychosocial risk. We don't want to get into a position where we're excusing behavior by examining ideological processes that lead to it, right? So that's sort of the shared conservative feminist view. We don't want to excuse the behavior, and if we start looking at these things, we're concerned that it'll become 
an excuse. It'll become exculpatory and therefore will lose sort of the, the f important framing of this, of this issue. Partially as a result of that, um, domestic violence perpetrators, um, the, the, the policy framing has encouraged or permitted um, something that I call vilification, um, a way of viewing perpetrators as particularly unworthy, um, sort of from the scapegoating literature and from the sort of phenomenological view of social welfare policy, the way we frame the help seeker affects what we do about it. And uh, this has led to an acceptance of depiction of perpetrators that we would not accept in any other sort of uh, client group. So in a, uh, in a book, 1998, um, uh, I believe it was a factor analysis extracting uh, characteristics of perpetrators, uh, they were described as either pit bulls or cobras, referring to those, I think, who are more reactive and those that are more strategic, but using uh, animals as symbols for humans. And what I would suggest is if you were to take some of those same acts of behavior, instead of a husband toward a wife, a mother toward a child, same acts of severity of brutalization, we would not permit and I don't think the editors of these books would have permitted to call them animals, yet we accepted it in terms of domestic violence perpetrators. Um, in a study of, uh, of men in prison for perpetration, um, men were referred to as monsters. And um, the term intimate terrorist has taken on a, a sort of a little bit of, of momentum and you find it surfacing in descriptions and other typological studies where um, men primarily are seen as terrorists um, willing to destroy out of some sort of vindictive purpose. So the current theoretical views of domestic violence are the what I call feminist so sociocultural, intergenerational transmission, and psychological psychosocial. Um, feminist sociocultural view ha has led to a uh, treatment approach, an analytical approach called the Duluth model. How many of you know the Duluth model? You've heard of it, you're in practice, you know about it. It, uh, it came out of the D D Duluth uh, Abuse Intervention Project in the 80s. Uh, it has zero empirical support for efficacy, but it's become the dominant framework for undertaking work with perpetrators in the United States and Canada. Um, as another aside, efforts to, um, to evaluate Duluth and Duluth-related models have repeatedly shown uh, zero to minuscule effect sizes, yet this is the mandated approach that is basically um, completely ineffective. Intergenerational transmission is social learning theory based. Children observe violent behavior in the home. They integrate it through observation, internalization, replication. It becomes part of how they conduct themselves in life. Psychological, psychosocial is where I think most of the important work is being done. And we've gone through quite a bit of that already over the last couple of days. Uh, I'll just mention these in passing. I won't get too down into the weeds here. Um, but. Um, personality disorders, neuro neurobiological factors, neuroanatomical factors, um, insecure attachment, uh, cognitive distortion, and, and PTSD. Uh, there's empirical support for personality disorders, severe depression, alcohol substance dependence and abuse, head injury, frontal lobe deficits, and um, PTSD. There's empirical support for these things being associated with domestic violence perpetration in spite of a policy framework that explicitly forbids these things from being considered. I want to talk about subtypes just briefly so I can move on to uh, the subset called, um, that I call family-only domestic violence. And so um, th these batter typologies 
are based on perpetrator treatment samples. Uh, a number of features are examined, personality features, mental health features, severity of violence features, and they tend to cluster in two or three types. Uh, the, the two that I'm going to focus on are the generally violent. The person is uh, assaultive of their partner. They're also generally violent. And the person that is partner-only violent. They're not violent outside of their relationship with their, with their partner. And so I was going to spend a lot more time talking about the general risk, but it's already been covered. And um, I noticed when some of my other colleagues were presenting, some of you were sleeping. So I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to do that, so I'm just going to hit them quickly and then move on to, uh, to family only. So about a quarter of the persons in these studies are identified as um, generally violent or antisocial. These are persons that are uh, sort of higher in sociopathy. Um, they're just as likely to hurt uh, uh, someone on the community as they are at home. Um, these persons are, are persons that if we were to map the construct batterer onto them. These are the, these are the folks that would be most likely to contour around that idea, yet they are not um, uniquely partner-only violent. So what does domestic violence, partner-only domestic violence, share with violence in general, and what is different about it? I, I'm fairly safe in, in saying that just about everything you heard about risk for violence in general has some significance for domestic violence perpetration. Everything from sort of genetic-based uh, neuroendocrinological risk to sort of um, uh, early socialization. And, and the things that predict violence predict domestic violence with a couple of, a couple of exceptions that I will get to. Um, a study from the, the Dunedin cohort study found that um, generally violent persons and family-only violent persons shared, uh, shared risk. However, the, um, the family-only persons were believed to be sort of less subject to, uh, to risk and had sort of a greater ability to constrain what they did and attributed that to better socialization, that persons that were partner-only assaultive seemed to be not quite as impaired and had greater sort of self-control than people that were generally violent. Um, and you can get the citations out of the articles, look at the, the Infant Mental Health Special Edition and, and, and get all the background on this, but uh, family-only perpetrators uh, are more reactive to stress and partner aggression. And um, Richard was talking about assortative mating uh, earlier today, and I'm going to make reference to that as well. Part of the diff diff difficulty in identifying early life risk for domestic violence, unlike early life risk for other forms of violence, is that domestic violence doesn't actually occur until later in the life cycle. You can observe violence in general in children, um, adolescents, but Domestic violence requires sort of partnering, reaching a point in adolescence or adulthood where, um, where one is secured a partner. The, the sort of most proximal risk factor then developmentally is dating violence. Um, and I believe it was, uh, Sarah, were you talking about dating violence earlier? Yeah, the, the rates of dating violence are actually higher for females than males. And that, um, that was, uh, I think Murray Strauss's last study before he died was an international study of dating violence, and he found that true in some great number of nations that he studied, that female perpetration of dating violence was greater than male perpetration um, in most, most countries. So early life maltreatment, exposure to violence, attachment problems, interacting with genetic risk, create a primary developmental susceptibility to subsequent life course risk for domestic violence. The severity of that risk has implications for generally violent or family violent outcomes, the latter perhaps often arising within stressful and highly conflictual relationships. This seems to be one of the things that differentiates family only from generally violent, that persons that are family only tend to be 
in relationships that are high stress or high conflict. So what are some of the things that we might identify as being relevant to family only? Some of the things that we've heard about <clears throat> earlier, genetic risks, interparental violence, abuse, maltreatment, and attachment problems. Um, in a study from the Ad Health data set, using twin data, genetic factors accounted for 24% of variance in striking a partner and 54% of the variance in injuring a partner. Um, We've heard about MAOA and the serotonin transporter gene as well. Those factors seem to be associated, those genetic factors seem to be associated with domestic violence perpetration as well. Uh, again, MAOA in another study. The MAOA effects seem to be most problematic for, uh, for males who are on the low expressive side who are also subject to maltreatment in childhood. It's the interactive effect of of maltreatment, abuse, and so forth with low expression of MAOA that leads to a greater risk of, of aggressive behavior. And that's found in, in domestic violence perpetrators as well. Um, yeah, skip that. So the question is, what is the role of interparental violence? So the social learning theory view, the intergenerational transmission view, is that children were watching their parents engage in violent behavior and therefore learning violent behavior through the mechanism of, of parental violence or child abuse. Uh, and studies that look at that um, exposure often find um, statistically significant but weak effects. So the question is, what is it exactly that's going on as a child is observing parental violence? And it would appear that um, it may not primarily be social learning theory driven, but neuropsychological impacts of fear and trauma from being assaulted and from observing caregivers assaulting each other. And so um, a study said uh, infants exposed to high accumulated interparental violence show increased cortical activity and adrenal cortical dysregulation as early as two months. We also find that elevated cortisol uh, occurs in men who are in domestically violent relationships where violence is occurring, where there's, parent, where there's a partner hostility. Um, in a prospective longitudinal study, exposure to interparental violence in toddlerhood and preschool could predict both domestic violence perpetration and victimization at age 23. So what we're going to see is that there's this sort of um, similarity of etiology for perpetration and victimization. Some of the variability in how females and males respond to early life uh, sorts of um, stress uh, may explain part of that. But there's kind of an equifinality in how persons find each other, form relationships that become high stress and then become problematic or violence. Um, abuse and maltreatment. The problem with studying abuse and maltreatment in young children is that much occurs in the lifespan between that and adult or adolescent mate selection. So part of the problem is how do you isolate uh, early effects of abuse and maltreatment? Um, one study found uh, an aggregate measure of severe physical child abuse uh, measured at age two and again at six found a correlation with both physical perpetration and victimization at the ages of 21 and 23. Um, however, other variables, for example, parent-child boundary violations in adolescence occurred later, had a stronger statistical association. The difficulty then is isolating those effects on something that doesn't occur until later in life. So I looked at some studies that may have some sort of um, explanatory use in looking at um, adult, adult offending. Um, the support the support is mixed for some of these things. Um, the one study, Appleyard et al., concluded that a measure of cumulative risk in early childhood better predicts adolescent behavior problems, including externalizing behavior, better than do individual risk factors, which I think is a way we need to think about domestic violence perpetration. What is the, 
sort of load of risk that the person carries, not do we isolate you know, child abuse or interparental violence and so forth, but what is happening to that person through their life course that leads them to that sort of, that sort of discontrol or, or violent orientation responding to partner uh, sorts of issues. Um, one study, and this, and this study was funded through NIAAA, I, after I said no one funds it, this study by, by George et al. found abnormalities in neural pathways and brain structures of alcoholic perpetrators, and the only reason that was funded is because it was a sample of persons with alcohol dependency. The domestic perpetration stuff was taken as sort of a, you know, a side bet, data that was collected as a side bet and subsequently analyzed, so it wasn't framed as a domestic violence study, and they found uh, abnormalities in, in, in uh, brain structure. So um, individual developmental risk for adult domestic violence perpetration, beginning with genetic and early life factors, then intersects with the developmental trajectories of one's intimate partner, creating a dyadic negative synergy of risk to, to briefly um, go back to the notion of assorted mating or sort of partnering um, I believe Richard was talking about it in terms of mental health issues, where persons with similar mental health profiles find each other. I think it's, it's, it's that and more, that people identify in each other a certain similarity, a certain orientation toward life. Perhaps it's even sort of lodged in an attachment process that I'll talk about shortly, where they partner with persons that share some of the issues they have. So, Persons that grew up in violent homes partner with people that grew up in violent homes. People that have sort of an anxious attachment posture find people that have anxious attachment or other sorts of attachment issues. They form these relationships and it makes a sort of alchemy of, of, of stress. I want to talk about uh, attachment theory just, just briefly. Bowlby had um, actually looked at an attachment-based uh, framework for for family violence, and he, and he said, quote, the behavior of men who ill-treat girlfriend or wife. And he used case studies to support that view, saying that he thought it was parental violence and neglect that created uh, patterns of anxious attachment in both perpetrators and victims, and the utilization of violence instrumentality is an instrumentality to prevent or head off abandonment or the fear of abandonment. You, you can't leave me. And so, so some of what we talk about is power and control motives in perpetrators may not be as much motivated by one's seeing another as an object of ownership, but rather as an attachment object whose departure is inconceivable. Eh, blah. Oh, this is a study I did. Um, this, this one I'll go into detail on. I, I, I'm giving myself too much credit here. Wait a minute. Um, Corvo found that aggregate childhood and adolescent separation loss events had the strongest bivariate correlation with severity of adult violence perpetration in a sample of perpetrators, more so than exposure to violence in the family of origin. So in, a, in, in a bivariate analysis, separation loss events was actually more strongly associated with severity of violence than were violence predictors, including observation of parental violence and, and child abuse. Um, when I sort of nested it into some multivariate analysis, it hung in there. It hung in there in the best predictor models um, as a, as a uh, strong predictor, um, primarily um, when holding other things um, in, as constant. So there's sort of something about attachment disruption leading to violence that has perhaps its own, its own pathway into it. So I'm just going to sort of freelance a little bit here about what I would see the sort of dual, dual effects of attachment disruption. That is, we know that um, poorly bonded children, erratic caregivers, uh, experience separation loss, and all these kinds of things at key developmental points. Uh, suffer a general sort of psychological consequence for that. Uh, you know, less ability to inhibit arousal and all these other things. But attachment disruption has its own particular specific relational 
impact as well, not just sort of a general sort of risk, but it affects how persons go into relationships and how they are in relationships. And that we know that attachment is fairly persistent through life. They get formed relatively early and they provide sort of a core structure, right? So in addition to the general sort of effects of attachment problems, we have specific issues which have to do with how do these different attachment styles play out in tandem with persons who have attachment issues who may also have been exposed to violence. Right? So it leads to partner choice, it leads to dysfunctional sorts of interactions, it leads to difficulty in being emotionally stable enough to withstand the conflicts of intimacy without resorting to primitive approaches to resolve these things. In tandem with persons who have attachment issues who may also have been exposed to violence. Right? So it leads to partner choice, it leads to dysfunctional sorts of interactions, it leads to difficulty in being emotionally stable enough to withstand the conflicts of intimacy without resorting to primitive approaches to resolve these things. Mm. So I was going to talk about implications for, for practice and, and policy, um, and, and I still am. I would made a, an, an assumption during the, the work that I do, is that 15 minutes still questions or 15 minutes altogether? Oh crap, I'll wrap it up. <laughs> so I would made this assumption that eventually the science on violence was going to penetrate into the program officer's consciousness at the Department of Justice and they were going to go, we can't keep this stupid model going any longer, the science is overwhelming. Has anyone been keeping track of what's happening at the Department of Justice? <laughs> so now I, I'm not sure where to go with this. That was my plan. Uh, I'm going to retire in two years. I think I'm out of time. So if anybody else wants to go with that strategy, help yourself. Maybe things will get, get better over time. Oh, one more minute. I'm not done yet. That was a pause. It was a pause. Holy crap, I'm getting played off the stage. <laughs> so many damn slides. Uh, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, Adrian, you had one job. Yes. Hello. Uh, so on the Wikipedia article for Erin uh, Pizzy, uh, her name is spelled P-I-Z-Z-E-Y, -E yeah. it says about her, Erin uh, Pizzy is known for having started the first domestic sh uh, violence shelter in the modern world, Chiswick Women's Aid in 1971, the organization now known, as, known today as Refuge. Uh, it goes on to say about her, Pizzy has been the subject of death threats and boycotts because of her research into the claim that most domestic violence is reciprocal, similar to what you were speaking, and the, I think it was a bombing threat uh, uh, and a kidnapping threat, uh, into the claim that most domestic violence is reciprocal and that women are equally capable of violence as men. Uh, Pizzi has said that the threats were from militant feminists. She has also said that she is banned from the refuge she started. Uh, my question generally, without going uh, too <laughs> long, is I'm having a, a great deal of difficulty making any impact on people when I, I bring up this issue as an activist at, at the University of British Columbia. Uh, corresponding to what you said uh, about the, the, the gender trend uh, from the University of British Columbia, when it comes to teen dating violence, boys are more likely to report being the victims of violence, being hit, slapped, or pushed than girls. That's the surprising finding of new research from UBC and SFU. 5.8% uh, of boys and 4.2% of girls said they had experienced dating violence in the past year. And I, I also met, this will be the last uh, point, uh, with uh, Don Dutton, who is a uh, professor emeritus in psychology, uh, 
at UBC. I asked him after our, uh, during our meeting, could you write me a letter with some of the statistics you ran by me? And he says, uh, several well-conducted surveys exist and show clearly and conclusively that the most common form of domestic violence is bilateral, matched for level of severity, 50% of all domestic violence. The second most common is, uh, form is female-perpetrated domestic violence against nonviolent males, 35%. Third most common, 15%. Sorry, I'm going quite a bit. The question. Well, the question basically is, why does this make no impact? Is there any authoritative source? Because it doesn't seem to me that any number of numbers, I mean, the man has impeccable credentials. We have one current professor at UBC. We have one former professor at UBC. It doesn't matter the news coverage. Uh, when I bring this, this uh, numbers so to people. We have your question. Yeah. We got it. I can hear you very well, yeah. You can. All right. So here's the question you should have asked. Why is social welfare policy irrational? That's the question you should have asked. So what I would suggest, you're a philosophy student apparently, go over to the so social work school at UBC and audit a course in social welfare policy. It'll become very clear to you why social welfare policy is irrational. Could you it's too long to respond to. Oh, uh, oh why, it's too, why it's irrational? Yeah, why it's irrational. Uh, uh, it's yeah. too long to respond to. I, I can't respond to the irrationality of social welfare policy okay. in a question and answer period now. So uh, okay. I would say go audit a class. It's a very complex issue. I think you'll find a satisfactory okay. answer there. Is it ideological corruption? Uh, some of it. Thank Other you. questions? So, Kenneth, do you have data on um, rates of uh, perpetrated murder uh, in the context of um, intimate partner violence of males on females, females on males. What do those data tell us? Yeah, um, I haven't looked at it in a while. Um, the uniform, uh, FBI uniform crime reports um, doesn't have a domestic violence partner datum that I know of. What they have is um, murdered by an individual known to kind of thing, to try to differentiate that from community violence. My recollection is that the, the murder of men by women may be a fifth of what it is of men of women. Male victimization and community homicide is many, many times higher, so the overall homicide rate for men is much higher. Women are more likely to be killed by someone known to them, whether it's partner, brother, boyfriend, that kind of thing. I don't have the exact number. Something about 1,500 for, for, for men as perpetrators and four or 500 for women, but that's buried deep in some memory closet. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned attachment theory is playing some role in the development of uh, policy, uh, or at least the understanding of domestic violence. Now, over my course of years, I've probably read 100 papers on attachment theory, and uh, during that time, it's always attachment to the mother. In other words, uh, you very seldom see any, any, if any reference to attachment being developed in regard to the child and the father. But we know that the, um, the biggest attachment uh, disruptions these days are the absence of fathering. So I'm wondering if there are any correlations that you have between a domestic uh, felonious behavior for either men or women that are correlated with attachment disruption with the father. No. No. <laughs> and this comes again to the distortions in our understanding of the situation and the lopsided Because, because it, doesn't, it doesn't get studied that way. There's studies that look at criminality and single parenting. So at that level, they are studied. To bring it down to the attachment level, this isn't something that... The, the, the research that I'm presenting to you, I hope, illustrates that how underfunded domestic violence research is, and to try to get at a sort of specific subtext of attachment disruption, I think is really... I can't see that happening. So that's, that, was, that was why my, my no came out. All right, so just, I, just I kind of, really, kind of well I like to say, field. I just want to include attachment disruption from the, from the father. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I, I found it interesting that you were talking about um, uh, perpetrators, you know, it being an issue of, a, of attachment, why, why they're dysregulating and, and becoming violent. And so it's really weird. All three days we've been talking about, like, community and, and attachment. And we talked about the term got brought up, reattachment, the possibility of reattachment. So let's say somebody has a, a healthy attachment, ages zero to five, they join the military at 18 years old. Is it possible that older attachments become weaker and then a reattachment comes? You go out into service with these fellows, you lose this friend, you come back and get separated from your from your team in this military. Are they being traumatized through the loss of attachment figures? And then we kind of took that a little further into an abusive relationship, um, thinking like, you know, when you look at a woman is there an attachment being formed, right? There's isolation, they're with this Repeat person. Repeat what you just said, I didn't hear it. Um, is there an attachment being formed in an abusive relationship? Kind of like you look at the military, they're isolated, they become dependent on each other for survivability, yeah. and then all of a sudden they're separated from those folks. Are they having a traumatic uh, effect to the loss of an attachment figure? And then moving forward to domestic violence, when we ask women, hey, leave him, are we actually asking them to traumatize themselves for the last of an attachment figure due to the fact that they've been isolated, they become dependent, survivabilities, right? There's this own little community in the midst. So are we actually, as we say this to, to women or men, right? But as we say this to women, are we asking them to traumatize themselves for the loss of an attachment figure? I think there's a lot of reasons that people stay in relationships that are um, dysfunctional and even violent. Um, so what have I've seen is that um, most women victims want to remain in a relationship where they've been hurt. They just don't want to be hurt anymore. Some of that I'm sure is um, attachment driven. Some of that is economic. Some of that is family. So I think it's a more complex mix of things. But I do know that in persons who um, or anxious attachment style, find sundering relationships extremely frightening and extremely um, difficult to do without emotional distress. Is, is, is there a possibility of forming new attachments, right? So let's say you have a healthy attachment with a family and you get with a cult or an abuser. Are you forming a new attachment with that person or are you still riding on the coattail of your previous attachment, zero to five? I don't know. <laughs> this is a very complicated question. <laughs> I just wanted to um, thank you, first of all, and secondly, to add a little bit of information. I doubt that you've heard of this because it was only released, I think, a month or two ago. But there, there is a new curriculum that is kind of uh, replacing in some ways the old Duluth model. And um, it's from Family Peace Initiative, if anybody wants to learn about it, Family Peace Initiative. And um, they've just published the new curriculum and they're going around the country and training people on this new curriculum that is based not on the uh, more rigid Duluth model, let me say, but on um, understanding trauma that has happened for um, quote unquote batterer uh, in batterer lives and doing that in a way that maintains accountability and responsibility. So it has a much more profound way of becoming deeply connected with the people who batter and then their recidivism rate for their program is so much better than other programs. Family Peace Initiative. Thank you. Hi. I just wonder, um, and I wasn't able to actually uh, see, when the studies and the statistics were gathered, because I'm, I'm guessing that they may have, may have been within the last 30 or 40 years, the statistics on how many uh, females 
to male or male to female and so forth, the pie chart that you had. And, um, and, and if there's any um, difference between the last 30 to 40 years and perhaps earlier on when we may have resembled more other societies in the world where I believe, and this is only a belief, that domestic violence may be more skewed towards male uh, males being the perpetrators. So I, I'm trying to understand because we are a society in flux and we are somehow, I mean, women have been fighting back in the last 30 or 40 years, let's face it, and maybe, you know, post-World War II. So maybe you could comment on that. These are, these are extensive. These are expensive national surveys and they done in the 70s, done in the 80s, the same data was replicated. I don't know if anyone else has replicated the Strauss and Gallus national surveys. If anyone knows if they have, let me know. I don't, I don't think they have. So we do know there are other indicators like um, the arrest of women, the increase of, of girls in juvenile crime, that kind of thing. Uh, you had a list of, of things that you said were prohibited from being studied because such things as intoxication is a quote-unquote excuse. But when you said, I, I think it was like 34% of violence is mutual, I, I, I'm going to take a wild guess that in many of those cases, you're going to have mutually intoxicated individuals, particularly on alcohol. Uh, is there any research that you know of uh, regarding um, Th things like uh, you know the relationship between alcohol abuse and the right. mutuality of uh, uh, of uh, aggression in couples. I just got the wrap up notice. So so what I'll say is there's similarity of risk for perpetration and victimization in terms of substance abuse using issues, in terms of mental health issues, in terms of attachment profiles, and so on and so forth. Um, how we make use of those things to do anything in treatment is a, another discussion. Maybe it's Paul's next conference. We'll do something about that. But um, yeah, the, substance, substance use, alcohol particularly, is one of the prime predictors of both perpetration and victimization. Thank you. All done.